Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Today, our guest is Andrew Friedman. He's a data scientist, astronomer, cosmologist, and researcher at the UC San Diego Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences. And he's a research affiliate at the MIT Science, Technology, and Society program. All that is to say that Andrew is uniquely positioned to take the world of quantum physics and mechanics and apply theory to the relatable world like taking the concept of entanglement and explaining it like two particles created at the same point and instant in space as being akin to the Corsican brothers. Okay, maybe that's just how I see it in my brain, and I'm a troglodyte. So I'm going to let Andrew do the explaining. He's been on the show before, and he returns to blow our minds again by explaining these phenomena along with how light that has traveled billions of years from long-expired quasars can close the freedom of choice loophole in the cosmic bell test. Don't worry, it'll all clear up when Andrew breaks it down. And remember, it really helps us out if you guys give us five stars and review us on iTunes, or if you subscribe if you're listening to us on YouTube, and hit the bell to turn on alerts when we put up new content. Thanks as always for listening. We really appreciate you. Now here's our guest today, Andrew Friedman. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, I'm Dr. Andrew Friedman. I'm a research scientist at the UC San Diego Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences. And I recently worked on an experiment trying to test something about quantum entanglement uh, using astronomical observations. It's called the Cosmic Bell Test. It was the subject of a recent uh, NOVA documentary on PBS. And you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah. We're here at UCSD doing what we do best is uh, talk and, and get my mind exploded by Dr. Friedman. And I have with me the uh, purveyor of Paella, Paul Demek, who's been on the show once before. And uh, we're going to record your own episode later on today. But we're looking for right forward now, to it. As, as if for right now, what we're going to do is, is talk to Andrew and try to figure out what we can figure out about quantum physics. Because this topic continues to fascinate me and just understanding the all of it, entanglement, mechanics, computing, quantum, you know, the big quantum, what all of it is. So I guess let's just backtrack a little bit because this stuff is really challenging. Let's talk about what the heck is a cosmic bell test and talk about the Nova documentary, which everybody should go see. You can see it on Nova. Actually, you can kind of see it on YouTube too, but um, tell us about it. Yeah. So, so quantum mechanics itself, uh, it's, it's our best theory of the subatomic world. And uh, it's, it's been with us for almost a century. And, uh, you know, all the digital technology that we rely on today, you know, iPads, computer circuits, lasers, telecommunication, it, uh, it relies on quantum mechanics. So, so quantum mechanics has allowed us to build incredible technologies, the kind of things that would look like magic to our ancestors. But something that's a, a, of, of chief interest for me and for, for many others in the, in the theoretical physics and uh, astrophysics community is that we still don't have a coherent story that we can tell about what the theory of quantum mechanics actually means about the real world. And this is, this is a sharp break from the way science has progressed before quantum mechanics, and, and it's a sharp break from our other sort of pillar of modern science, which is Einstein's theory of general relativity, a theory of gravity. The theories are very different from each other. We don't know how to make them play nice with each other in, in certain regimes, and we think that in theoretical physics there has to be more to the story. So one of the ways of trying to make progress is to think about some of the weirdest features of quantum mechanics to try to design experiments that uh, involve not just quantum mechanics, but parts of the universe as a whole. And maybe we can make progress there. So we're interested in the phenomenon of, of quantum entanglement. And uh, in, entanglement is one of the features of quantum mechanics that some people find the weirdest. It, it, it seems almost magical. Yeah. So if you have a pair of entangled particles and I send one off to one observer, let's call her Alice, and the other to Bob, the other observer... And as soon as Alice measures something about her entangled particle, she instantly knows something about future measurements on Bob's half. So let's say she's measuring uh, the polarization of a photon, a particle of light. And then Alice has a device that's very similar to polarized sunglasses. And 
she has it at some orientation angle. Maybe she's switching between having it over here and having it over here. Like horizontal versus vertical or something. Yeah, or, or, or some intermediate angle in between. So she's got two possible choices, and Bob's got two possible choices. And the, a typical uh, entanglement experiment works like this. You have a source of entangled photons, for example. It's, it's shooting out many of them per second, millions per second. And Alice then has to find some way of making a choice. And so the, in each time, the photon can either get absorbed in, in the effect of with sunglasses right. or go through. And so she can measure like an outcome of, you know, did it go through or not? If you look at Alice's side, you, you look like, you see what looks like a random string of outcomes. Bob sees something that looks random on his side. But when they later compare notes and compare them, the answers line up. And they line up way too much mm-hmm. compared to a worldview, um, the kind of worldview that Einstein wanted to be true. If, if you try to tell a, a coherent story about what's actually happening, how do they line up? You know, each time a measurement is made by, by Alice, the outcome is essentially random, 50-50. Mm-hmm. She doesn't know if, if she's going to measure, let's say, horizontal polarization or vertical polarization. But you have a random outcome on one side and a random outcome on the other, yet they're correlated. Right. We now know that you can't actually use this to instantly send information from one point to another. Because if you did that, then, then you would have a science fiction device, you know, instant communication. And, and uh, it's too bad you can't do that. But wait, hold on. So right there, when we talk about entanglement, these things are the same thing in effect, but there is still a, a time lag between the information passing between them? Is that what you're saying? So when you ask, are they the same thing? There is a sense in which the joint system of both particles together cannot be separated. Okay. So if, if the system is maximally entangled, then I, I, can, I can know um, as much as possible about the joint system, but as little as possible about each individual. So the individual particle, it's really 50-50. That means you like know nothing yeah. about whether it's going to go through or not each time. But, but in certain circumstances, um, you, can, you can have it where um, you, get a, you get complete information uh, for certain orientation angles of your measurement devices. Sometimes if, if you measure horizontal for Bob, you know Alice measured vertical or vice versa. For intermediate measurement angles, it's not a perfect correlation, but it follows a trend that's predicted by, by quantum mechanics. Um, but you know, Einstein was very skeptical of, of entanglement and thought quantum mechanics had to be incomplete because it seems to, to violate his theory of special relativity, which says that no information can travel faster than the speed of light. Mm. Uh, but we, we now actually know, you know, going back to your question about the time lag, that despite appearances, you can't actually use this to do magic. N- nothing you can do on Alice's side can controllably influence what Bob will see. In order to do that, Alice would need to know better than 50-50 what the outcomes are going to be, and, and she can't do that. So the best she can do is send a random string of ones and zeros to Bob which is not sending any information at all. It's random, yeah. So it seems to, to still obey the, the letter of, of relativity, but it violates the spirit of it because something weird is, is happening. So it's correlation at a distance, but not information transfer at a distance. So the best we can say right now, there is a, some kind of connection. There's some between, kind of connection. Yeah, we just don't know what that is yet, but there is, there, yeah. And that connection is not instantaneous, but it is faster than light? Well, we, we think still that no information can travel faster than light in this process. Okay. It is still debated whether or not there is something instantaneous going on. When people are trying to tell a story about what, what the hell is going on with entanglement, the question is, how do we tell that story? So perhaps there is something that's instantly transferred, but doesn't allow you to violate relativity. And that's part of, of what we're trying to investigate with these experiments. And there's kind of a longer story um, about, uh, you know, why it is that the results of entanglement tests are so weird. So uh, John Bell was a physicist in the 1960s, and he, he kind of took some of the ideas that Einstein had and, and really formalized them mathematically. Um, and initially, you know, people had thought that certain things would, would not be amenable to experimental tests in quantum mechanics, but Bell was able to figure out a way to, to design a test that could distinguish between quantum mechanics and the kinds of alternative models that Einstein wanted to be true. So Einstein, Einstein was a philosophical realist. So he wanted there to be a real world that existed independent of what we observe or what we think about it, yeah. something that science is revealing. And there are many physicists today that are still interested in kind of continuing Einstein's tradition. But the truth of it is that the findings of modern quantum mechanics have thrown the realist program into, into doubt. And so there are a lot of physicists who actually abandon realism, the idea that there's this 
objective external world because it seems like the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics is not compatible with it. But Einstein wanted there to be realism. Yeah. He also wanted the world to, to obey uh, the principle of locality, which means mm. that relativity is true. Things can only interact if they touch each other or if they send signals that are traveling at the speed of light or slower. So there's no instantaneous influence at a distance causally. So uh, Einstein thought that would be you know, magical and didn't want that to be true. And, yeah. and then, so, so, so realism and locality, and, and then the assumption that's most relevant for the Cosmic Bell experiment that we did, it has to do with wh how, whether or not uh, we are free to make our experimental choices in a, in a choice, in an entanglement test. So when Alice mm. is choosing her, her polarizing filter angles, is she really free to do that? Are these choices, free choices that are not correlated with anything in the past of the experiment that's missing from quantum mechanics? Right. Or, or could they be? So what John Bell did is, is he, he figured out that if you, if you assume realism and locality and, and freedom of choice for your measurements, then there's an upper limit to how often the measurement outcomes for an entanglement test could agree. Right. So there's an upper bound. And when, but when you actually do the experiments, that upper bound is, is violated. The real experiments in nature demonstrate more correlation than this world. It's statistically view. significant correlation. Absolutely, right. it's 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 this is these experiments. Are you, are you anywhere near one, or is it like you know, when you know the correlation's got a value? So so we we, we usually uh, define the, the correlation parameter in a different way. Um, mm. it, you're talking about like the Spearman row sure. correlation coefficient. This can be changed, but in the typical way, we write down a quantity that that in uh, the the maximum limit is two but quantum mechanics can get all the way up to two times the square root of two, which is 2.8. And so if we do an experiment and we, we see uh, that we're measuring uh, 2.6 plus or minus 0.1, mm -hmm. we, 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 that's very different from two. Um, yeah. and, and, uh, and then we can say, you know, at, at you know, some number of standard deviations of statistical significance, we have violated Bell's inequality. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so you've got, you've got a value north of two, and that tells you that we've, we're we're disproving Einstein at some measure. We have some correlation to where where there shouldn't be if we're living in a natural laud world. So, if you do the experiment in you know on some islands like you guys do, but then I go and I do a, a different Bell test, equally as academically appropriate, will I get a different value? Where I be at two point six eight like you guys were? And I'm not saying you guys were two point six eight. I'm just making a number up. Well, the, the, the actual number you get depends on your experimental apparatus. So okay. very rarely do experiments get all the way up to the maximum theoretical limit of sure. close to 2.8. So sometimes it has to do with how good your entangled particle source is or uh, um, other things in your experimental right. setup. So in this kind of framework, the, the, the question people ask is, you know, if, if, if the, the hypothesis you're trying to rule out um, is Einstein's worldview, a local realist worldview, where the upper bound is 2, then the question is, at, at any measurement where you have a statistically significant measurement that's different from two, you know, 2.1 plus or minus 0 0.00001 would, would count as a statistically significant violation of Bell's inequality. Mm -hmm. 2.8 plus or minus 0.2 would also count. Uh, and, and dozens of these experiments have been done over the years. And uh, if, if you make the assumptions that went into Bell's theorem, if the world is, is local and realist, and obeys freedom of choice for the experimenters, then you can say that, that you've ruled out the kind of worldview Einstein wanted. But if you relax any of the assumptions, these are just assumptions. Right. They're, they're not necessarily true in our world. Then you open up loopholes where alternative explanations different from quantum mechanics are still viable. So the thing that's, that's really interesting to me about this whole you know, study into the, the fundamental nature of reality is that what we know for sure Given Bell's theorem, and given that experiments have consistently violated Bell's inequality, is that at least one of the assumptions that went into Bell's theorem cannot be true in our world. Right. So we either need to give up realism, or locality, um, or freedom of choice, or some combination of them. Um, there are other ways of casting this where you have different assumptions, but you know the, the bottom line is that you're never going to go back to a world that's as simple as Einstein wanted. We know enough now to know that's not possible. Mm. but some of the key things that Einstein wanted to be true, like, like realism, you actually don't have to give that up. It, mm -hmm. it is not, um, you're not forced to do it based on the evidence and based on the, the mathematics and, and the physics behind, behind Bell's theorem. So 
in our cosmic bell test, we're, we're interested in attacking this freedom of choice assumption. And, you know, to be fair, if you give it up, you're still giving up something weird because you, you usually think, well, you know, naively, uh, if I'm going to do an experiment, I'm free to choose what I measure. Yeah. Um, if, if the universe could somehow conspire to change its answers based on the questions we choose to ask, you know, some people think about it as, well, how could you even do science at all? Right. But I think that that, 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 that point of view, unfortunately, has led the community for many years to kind of ignore this particular question. So, so I, I would turn it around and, and, and talk about freedom of choice in a different way. So if you have to give up 100% of your freedom of choice in, in a certain measure in, in the, and then you have no freedom whatsoever, well, many people talk about the world as being deterministic. That's, that, that's what you're saying with that, right? But that's one possibility. Yeah. So let's say, so, so classical physics, New, Newtonian physics, the kind mm-hmm. of physics that many of us learned in high school, it's a deterministic theory. If you know the initial conditions and the, the laws of physics, you can predict the future. Mm-hmm. And the precision with which you can predict the future depends on how precisely you know the input conditions. You never mm-hmm. know them perfectly. Yes. But in principle, you could yeah. predict the future indefinitely. Or you could predict what the past was from, you could retroject what, what the past yeah. was. Yeah. So, so in, in, if the world really is deterministic, then it's actually totally natural for freedom of choice to be, to be violated. There, there also are, are interesting middle grounds. So let's say that, that uh, you actually don't give up 100% of your freedom, but you give up some small portion of it, mm-hmm. suitably defined in a mathematical way. We, what we've shown in our recent theoretical work is that it's actually possible to keep locality, to keep realism, by giving up a modest amount of freedom. So, but, but you're talking about a, a, a super tiny amount that you would never notice in, in regular day-to-day life. So, so I, w- I would turn the question around to sort of say, is giving up this amount of freedom something that, that uh, is, is too hard to live with? Well, let me ask you a, a slightly different question. You know, when, when you're making a choice in your life, do you think that that choice is completely independent of things in its past? Oh. No, I wouldn't say mm-hmm. so. So, so for, for, for a practical level, I mean, you know, when you're talking about human free will, this is, this is a distinct concept. The, the, this, this, this freedom of choice has to do with whether or not measurement choices are correlated with things in the past of the experiment. It's not the same thing as human free will and free choice. Mm-hmm. But when we think about, you know, making a choice uh, on a day-to-day, you know, level, I don't think any of our choices are, like, totally free to just sprout into existence without right. any anything in the past influencing them. Yeah. I mean, even by disregarding the past, you've let, allowed the past to influence the decision in some way. I, I understand what you're saying, I think. The, the, I don't... Well, well, yeah. fair, fair, fair <laughs> enough. But, but, but uh, I mean, if, if you yourself are, are like, you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to ignore what happened the last time that I, that I chose to do this. Yeah. Then, then it is influencing you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let, yeah. let me take us off the rails from this a little bit. Sure. Um, does that mean that John Knox was right? He's, uh, he's the guy that started basically the Presbyterian Church, and they believe in predestination because God's already, he knows, he's all-knowing. He's a quantum god almost, you know, like he knows everything. So, so are you talking about like Calvinism and, and that yeah, kind of thing? Yeah, that's exactly the thing, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so well, okay, if, if, if the world is, is deterministic, the idea is that, you know, given the initial conditions of, of the world at some time, you can predict the, the future state of the world. But, but I think you need to be a little bit more precise about whether or not that, that means that, that things are, are predestined. Right. So, so there's a possibility, for example, that let's say, you know, conscious beings like us living in a world like that could figure out what the future is to infinite precision. But, but most likely, we, we couldn't actually ever do it. So maybe there's some, you know, God's eye view perspective where you could predict the future like that. But, but, but no, no humans, no, no aliens, no, no anybody who, who is, uh, has access to a finite amount of information inside the system could ever um, have that complete knowledge. So for all practical purposes to, to us, there would always be uncertainty in predicting yeah. the mm-hmm. future, and there would be no no way of knowing whether or not, uh, with, with any experiment, um, whether or not the world was really perfectly deterministic. It, it's a it's a weird question. Uh, mm. So 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 I would say that that uh, it's a philosophical position which is logically possible, but it would take a lot of. Uh, it, it, I mean, I don't know if it's possible for there to be evidence that would convince everybody of that that, that predestination was was real. You know, so, but a hundred so, years ago, mm-hmm. we were at the same point when it came to, you know, Bohr's world and Einstein's world, right? 
Well, well, I, th- I think that the, the the debate between you know Bohr and Einstein it, it definitely was related to these questions. The sort of key issue there, I think, is is whether or not uh, th- there was a real world um, underneath the hood of quantum mechanics. Uh, but Bohr's position was was basically that quantum mechanics uh, doesn't allow you to ask about the real world. It, it's just about what you can learn from experiments and measurements. So. Unfortunately, that, that program has been uh, dominant in the theoretical physics community. It's the so-called uh, Copenhagen interpretation of mm-hmm. quantum mechanics, sometimes called the shut up and calculate approach, where you can use quantum mechanics to, to make predictions about uh, quantum systems, but you sweep away the philosophical discussion about what's actually going on. So if you're in the realist camp, like Einstein was, you, 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 ac- you actually want to know, well, Sure, my, the theory is, is great. I can use it. I can, I can make really precise predictions about certain things. But what is it about? What are we talking about? You know, what, what's the story of what's happening at the subatomic level? And, and we, we still don't have that story. And so nowhere in quantum mechanics, in my opinion, li- like with entanglement, does this, this lack of the story you know, really hit you in the face. We, we don't know how to tell a story. Yeah. So kind of jumping a little bit back to, to the, the cosmic bell experiment, so, so our, our idea was, instead of letting anything on Earth choose our measurements for this entangled particle test, like human experimenters, Alice and Bob, or even you know, random number generating boxes that live on Earth, we outsource the choice of those measurements to the universe. So we let light from distant galaxies that's been on its way for billions of years. The quasars, uh, yeah. Yes, the, the, the quasars. There's a, there's a particular kind of bright galaxy that was mm-hmm. really, really useful for this. We let the color of that light choose uh, in real time which measurements were made on the entangled particles while they were in flight. And what you, can, what you can say with an experiment like that, given the fact that we did observe violation of Bell's inequalities at high statistical significance, if we assume that Einstein's theory of relativity is true and that causality works in the way that we think and information can't travel faster than light, then because the quasars, you know, one of them was, was a little over 12 billion um, light years away and the other was just under 8 billion light years away, we can say that it's still possible for an alternative, you know, local realist explanation like Einstein wanted to explain the results of the entanglement test, but it would have to have been in place, you know, 8 billion years ago. So there's, there's a, a smaller and smaller corner of space and time where these alternatives could, could be living. We have not ruled them out, no. but, but we, we've sort of, given the assumptions we made, we, we're, we're, uh, we're pushing them back further and further and making, making it less plausible. So... Uh, quantum mechanics is is safe for the moment. So, so I would say that that our results are consistent with quantum mechanics, but it, but they don't definitively prove quantum mechanics is is the correct and final theory at that scale. But uh, you know, the the hope in doing these kinds of experiments is that maybe you'll see something unexpected that would give you evidence that would point you in the direction of of new physics beyond quantum mechanics that might uh, help you understand how to merge quantum mechanics and general relativity mm-hmm. t- together. But you know, it's just it's just fun to think about these these incredibly crazy things, and yeah, it it it, it was really really a, a cool experience to you know be part of the team that came up with the idea for the experiment, to uh, put together a collaboration to fight yeah. for funding, and we were able to get the funding from the U.S. National Science Foundation, and then we partnered with uh, Anton Zeilinger's quantum optics group in uh, Vienna, and his group uh, they're they're some of the world's leading uh, experimentalists in quantum optics. And our team in the U.S. had astronomers and cosmologists who know all about uh, quasars and and telescopes. And you know, we, we were actually able to, you know, just just over six and a half years from idea, do the experiment in the Canary Islands. Yeah. And uh, that was the subject of this recent uh, Nova documentary. It's just it's just super fun to, you know, to to see your own work um, displayed in in a forum. Like this is a show I grew up watching. And you know, yeah. I I, I it's like the flagship science program in the U.S. And I, I think, you know, three and a half to five million people watched it, you know, live or later. And compared to, you know, a scientific paper that you write. Oh, yeah. That, Come that, on. Yeah. <laughs> a, so, so like a successful scientific paper might get read by dozens, cited yeah. by, you know, 100 people or something. Yeah. You literally are counting citations and getting stoked. You're like, you hit 40 and you're like, it's 40, but it's like every day it's going. You're like, this is from our friends who are listening. Mm-hmm. When you get cited, it's a big deal for your ego, but also it validates your work that your peers look at it and go, wow. And as you see that go up, you get really fired up, but that number is measured in triple digits most of the time at best. 
you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, so so, so we're we're talking about a completely different level of yeah. reach to to have you know a and and that you know who who knows how many people have watched the bootleg YouTube video, you sure, know? and it, it's it's but it's just it's I just can cool. tell you how many I look right now. That's okay. how I watched. It. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I think it's on Amazon Prime too. You know, um, yeah. But 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 ultimately, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think that, that scientists are doing science just to like keep it all locked up yeah. in the ivory tower. It's it's about sharing it with everybody. I mean, mm -hmm. and it's sci science belongs to everybody. the The real world is is, is out there uh, to, be, to be to be discovered. Let's play with this a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have a question specifically? Yeah, there's one thing I I didn't understand. They uh, this this bell experiment. I just got exposed to it coming on the way down here. Oh, I, sure. Uh, it's fascinating. I don't understand though. You have these the lights coming or the emissions coming from these two different quasars, and there are billions of light years of separation, and is it, somehow they're impacting one another. Why can't you look at that and say, "Wow, if if not proof, then therefore very strong indicator that something actually can travel faster than the speed of light." So, so just to step step back a little bit, um, if I didn't make this clear, that's that's my fault. So. It's probably my the, understanding, yeah. actually. So, so, so. so the, the entangled particles themselves are generated on Earth. Mm -hmm. they, they, they are generated at the same point in space and time, and they, they have a shared causal history. Mm -hmm. they, they're sent off to two different measurement stations, and while the, while the entangled particles are in flight, you need some way to, to set the polarization angle of your filter mm -hmm. um, on both sides. That's what so, the galaxy so, does. So there's a, mm -hmm. there's a telescope uh, next to each measurement station, Measuring light that's been on its way for billions of years. So, right. so the, the quasar A and quasar B, they are as unentangled and you know with each other as possible. Right. That the, their shared causal history goes back to, you know, thirteen point one billion years ago. The, yeah. the, we we think that the Big Bang happened thirteen point eight billion years ago. Okay. So these these guys, no third party could have talked to quasar A and quasar B since you know less than a billion years after the beginning of the universe. Okay. So. The light from the quasars is used to to randomly choose the measurements on both sides. So, the the quasar light it, it is not the case that quasar A um, could have communicated with quasar B okay, okay. in the history of the universe. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and that's a totally reasonable misunderstanding. Uh -huh. We don't know yet how to do an experiment where we actually take astronomical light from far away and do an entanglement kind yeah. of experiment with 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 uh, you know that kind of light. But what we can do is we are using astronomical sources as random number generators. Where we can be sure, based on our assumptions and our arguments, that the the bit of information that shows my measurement really came from a long time ago okay. in a galaxy far, far away. So within the, the three principles that Bell puts out, it seems like you're addressing the freedom of choice the most. Yes. Um, because you're not only not dealing with locality, because you're talking about half a mile distance total. Well, we, we actually are. Um, oh, you are so, testing so, that as so, well. So okay. the, way, the way that we're dealing with locality... So, so one one loophole that would allow um, a non quantum explanation, you know, like Einstein wanted, to mimic or fake or simulate quantum mechanics would be if somehow information um, on Alice's side about her measurement choice or outcome leaked over to Bob, and then mm -hmm. Bob could could like uh, choose his measurement um, in a certain way and be guaranteed of a of a certain outcome. Right. So um, that that's the locality or communication loophole. So how do you get around that? How do you close that? Um, so. It, Assuming that relativity is true, if I if I um, send off the entangled particles and I choose the measurement setting at the last instant mm -hmm. while the entangled particles are still in flight, then I can guarantee that that there's no there's not enough time for any information through any signal traveling to, at the speed of light or slower it, yeah. to go from one side to the other. So we're actually closing locality. Um, th there are other loopholes that we're not closing at the same time. In our, in our experiment, but we are addressing locality and closing it. Let me ask you, again, I'm probably going to understand this, Dan. Then mm -hmm. again, those emissions from those quasars come, and they're entangled here on Earth, and then we know that because when they're separated here, from, from our perspective, we see some kind of correlation between the two, right? So are, are you, you're talking about just the quasars th th themselves? Whatever, the whatever they're emitting from the quasars, yeah. I'm trying to understand. The so, quasars, so, so, I'm going to mm -hmm. see if I can do this. Okay. Let's try the quasars are a random number generator. They yeah. are a decision-making factor mm -hmm. on the filtering, yes. right? They have nothing to do... And there's no entanglement here as it's coming to us. It's the, the they, quasars are not entangled with each other. Right, right. Gotcha. And so we're talking about the the photons that are being sent horizontally in, right. in this case, okay. right? It has nothing to do with the quasars shooting vertically. Okay. It's a horizontal source of photons. How did mm -hmm. I do? Yeah, oh, that's, that's, that's good. If I looked at, like, the, the sequence of, like... Uh, 
we, we use uh, whether the photon is redder or bluer than the cutoff of 700 nanometers in wavelength mm -hmm. as our choice of whether it's a one or a zero for our random number generator. If you look at like the, the sequence of ones and zeros for the measurement settings of quasar A mm -hmm. and then quasar B, you're not going to see those correlations. Right. So, so, that, so that you can't learn anything about quasar B's measurement choice from quasar A's measurement okay. choice. And that was by design. Right. It's not impossible for there to be a correlation based on a shared history, but uh, between the light from the quasars and then the random choices. But it would have to have been in place, you know, 13 plus billion years ago for, for a, um, a third event, even more distant in time from the, the events when the light from the quasars mm -hmm. was emitted to have jointly influenced both of them in order to coordinate some sort of correlation that, that emerged later. So the, the, the difference is, let's say you let something on Earth, let's say, let's say you know, you guys chose the measurements mm -hmm. on Earth. And, you know, you're choosing your sequence and, and, and Pete's choosing a sequence. Well, somebody else could say, well, how do I know you guys didn't conspire and talk to each other earlier? And, and you know, yeah. Um, yeah. but, but uh, the, the, well, the, the, the interesting thing um, is, is that in, in a scenario like that, the, even the best plan that you could, you could do, what, one, one way that you can characterize entanglement tests is, is as a game. It's been proven that if you guys met and, cor and cor cor you know, corresponded in advance, came up with a strategy, but didn't talk during the experiment, you could win the game 75% of the time if there were no entangled particles involved. But if there are entangled particles, you can win the game 85% of the time. And that doesn't seem like maybe a big difference, but that's actually equivalent um, in, a, in a different way of thinking about it to um, the limit of 2 versus the limit of 2 times the square root of 2, 2.8. 85% is the maximum um, you know, quantum limit. But... Uh, I mean, these are all great questions. This, this is crazy and, and complicated stuff, mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's it's uh, it, it's it's my fault if uh, if some of the parts of it are, are unclear. But it, the the basic idea is that we're trying to learn about the the meaning of quantum entanglement. What explanations for it are still viable? Quantum mechanics is one explanation. Uh, local realistic explanations like Einstein wanted or others, and we're trying to uh, talk about uh, the regime in space and time where local realistic explanations could still live. And what we've done is shown that, well, we can't rule them out entirely, but they would have had to have been in place in the very early universe. Now, maybe, maybe, maybe that's what happened. And is it not possible that, and I, however unlikely, but this is what we're trying to close these loopholes, that something could interact with that light in route to create you know, some kind of bias? That's, that's, that's a great question. So we make a bunch of complicated arguments about why we can really trust Okay. That uh, that the bit was generated um, as far away ago in space and time as we think it was, but we also um, do talk about things that could happen along the way that could screw us up, and which of those things actually could matter, which of those things wouldn't affect us at all, um, and the the upshot is that uh, we're we're pretty confident that even if let's say some process more nearby was really responsible for that, that choice. Yeah. And, and it, it wasn't the quasar emission, but something, maybe it was something that happened a billion years afterwards. Right. And, and there's, some, there's some plausible astrophysical things that could happen. Um, e even with that, it doesn't really change the structure of our argument at all. We're still pushing back um, you know, extremely far into yeah. space and time where, um, where any alternative explanations could live. In, in a previous experiment we did, in 2017, the, the Canary Islands test with quasars was in 2018. We used stars in our own galaxy as a sort of pilot test, and um, we pushed things back, you know, 600 years ago. So we pushed it from 600 years ago to, to 8 billion years ago. So yeah. the question you ask is a great one, but, but uh, what we found is that none of the other things we considered really uh, jeopardized our conclusion. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at PDA Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. The question you ask is a great one, but, but uh, what we found is that none of the other things we considered really uh, jeopardized our conclusion. And then also, uh, it can be that things interfere with the ability, because you guys had this problem, the weather just said no, so the galaxies couldn't make their decisions. And 
but that's a different thing. But that is sort of akin to the things that may happen along the way during 12 million or 12 billion years of, of uh, travel. Well, that, that, it, it, that, 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 that's an interesting kind of thing. That there, are, there are other loopholes one could talk about that kind of have to do with this question of, um, can you even do the experiment at all? And the Ooh. weather is one of those things that, uh, well, you know, maybe you wanted to make your measurements during this time period, but the mm -hmm. weather doesn't allow you to point your telescopes up at these galaxies and, and you know, get light from it. There, there's another loophole that has to do with uh, the fact that, so the, you know, the entangled particles go through your polarizing filter, and, and when they make it through, they get measured by some device, e you know, either a, a very fast photon counting device, um, the things we use are called single photon avalanche diodes. Um, the, uh, you know, other experiments could use a digital camera, for example. Uh, but no, no, no detector is perfectly efficient. So let's say you had a scenario where um, your detector only detects 10% of the things that go through. Well, then it could actually be that, let's say you counter the 90% that you're missing, maybe it's actually, um, maybe the Bell violation would go away. Maybe it's consistent with, with local realism. And so the way you close that loophole is by um, using detectors that are super efficient, you know, 80, 90 percent that are uh, only recently been developed, where uh, the photons that you don't detect are not enough to, to push you in the other direction. But you could con conceivably build a model where you say that, well, it turns out that I was going to do this experiment for, I, I, I needed, you know, um, 10,000 runs of data in order to uh, get a statistically significant conclusion. And I was going to do it during this two-hour block, but the, the weather prevented me. You, you, could, you, could, you could say, well, I'm speculating that, well, if I had been able to do the experiment during that, that time when the clouds were up, maybe I would have gotten a different result. But, um, you know, at the, at, at, at the end of the day, I, I think that once you build up sufficient statistics in, your, in, in the set of data that you're actually able to, to get, it becomes less and less plausible that something like that could could explain it you know if, if you if you only had like a, a very tiny sample of data there might be some hope for some crazy explanation like that yeah. but okay um but uh i mean it, it's not that crazy in the sense that if you're actually asking fundamental questions about is the world uh, deterministic um do, do do i have free choice to make my measurements sure um uh, may, maybe you know i wanted to do the experiment at 5 p.m and i can't do it you know yeah, we I mean, needed to be dark, so you know, eight p.m. You go through some really interesting philosophical um, paths when you're trying to think yeah. through these things. Paul's got his thinking eyes on. That is, yeah, the, yeah, I, yeah. I, I see that. No, yeah. I got questions here, but I'm making the assumptions. There's a lot of people listening to this a lot smarter than I am. For some, their sake, I'm not going to waste your time. You've not met. So, Charlie. what's that? You've not met Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> well, Charlie. Well, well, what I what I would say so, is, is that Charlie. is that. Uh, you know, to, to, to you and, and to, you know, any listeners out there, curiosity is, is always a good thing. And there, there's no such thing as a stupid question, especially when it comes to this um, super complicated stuff that it takes yeah. decades to get your, your head around the terminology. Mm -hmm. It really is a foreign language. I'm speaking in English nominally, um, yeah. but, but. Well, you said, you said hex 10 a minute ago. That's not English. Well, whatever, you know? what, 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 <laughs> yeah, whatever jargon, you know, I use, I'm, I'm trying yeah. to kind of define it yeah. in, so let, let me ask you a practical question then. Okay, so as we look at the collision of Einstein and, and quantum theory, there's things that we don't know about a lot of science. Like as far as I know, we don't we know what gravity does. We really don't know what it is. Like, you know, yes, mass, but these are also sort of similar to spooky action at a distance. These, you know, Jupiter and its moons are are connected through gravity, but like why? Where does gravity come from? Who turned it on? I can you turn it off? Is that related to the quantum world then? So we, we, we think in, in theoretical physics that probably the answer is yes, and we have to understand exactly how that connection works to come up with the theory of so-called quantum gravity that, that brings together quantum mechanics and relativity. It might be a quantum theory of gravity where we take Einstein's theory of general relativity and make it more like quantum mechanics. It might be a, a deterministic theory that is more like general relativity, mm -hmm. or it could be something completely new and, and, and different that... Uh, it doesn't look anything like either of the theories. But but as far as gravity you know, goes, in, in Einstein's general relativity theory, we think of gravity not as a force between two objects, but as uh, a manifestation of the curvature of space, curvature and space. Time this, yeah. itself. Okay. So, but it's always represented two-dimensionally. Well, we, we, the, we are limited to three dimensions uh, of the world that we can perceive. Mm -hmm. right. so, so when we represent the curvature of space and time, we're actually thinking about curvature in three dimensions yeah but but we make a two-dimensional analogy like a bowling ball on a rubber sheet yes 
Um, and that, that's, a, that's the limit of the fact that, that we live in a three-dimensional world. You know, we mathematically can write down what curvature looks like in three, four, five, six, whatever dimensions. Yeah. But our capability to, to visualize, we're, we're limited to slices that can be displayed, right. um, you know, in a, in a three-dimensional world. So, so you, you can have, like, a, a two-dimensional movie that captures, like, a third by yeah. using time to represent things. Um, but uh, the, 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 those are called uh, embedding diagrams, and th they're useful as analogies, but, but they're, not, they're not perfect. But, but I guess the one way of thinking about it is that um, in, in general relativity, the reason why the Earth orbits around the Sun is it's actually traveling... On a curved space. Well, it's, it, yeah. it's traveling in curved space, but the path that it's going is, is the equivalent of a straight line in curved space. It's the mm -hmm. shortest point. Yes. The, the shortest distance between two points in curved space is... is is where it's traveling, you know. So, uh, you know, as as an analogy, um, if you live on the surface of the sphere, not not on a flat plane, and you want to get from the the North Pole somewhere, the shortest distance between two points is actually going to be part of a great circle that goes mm -hmm. around. Uh, it's 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 not going to be, you know, you, you're not allowed in that situation to go through the middle of the the sphere. You're you're stuck to the surface. Because yeah, any yeah. pilot traveling across the ocean knows. So. Yeah. So yeah. so yeah. So 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 we 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 have. Uh, you know, from from our understanding of you know latitude and longitude on the globe, mm -hmm. you know, you you have an idea of those kinds of paths, um, you know, on on the surface of the of the Earth. Mm -hmm. But but th that that that's the way that gravity is thought of mm -hmm. in, in okay. general general relativity. But it could very well be that in our next theory of physics, that there's something even more fundamental than space and time, mm -hmm. and more fundamental than gravity. That is where where our starting point is. And there are a lot of people who are interested in the idea of entanglement itself as that more fundamental um, mm. way of thinking about things. So, you know, I talk about entanglement between particles, but entanglement is really more broad in general than that. It's even more fundamental than quantum mechanics. It really is just this question of if you have two different regions, you can think of them as regions of space, but um, you can think of them even more abstractly. Yeah. If, if two regions, places, things, whatever, are entangled, it means that they're correlated with each other, that I can measure something about one and I learn about the other. Mm -hmm. um, and if they're uncorrelated with each other, then I can't learn anything. They're independent of each other. Mm -hmm. So things that are totally independent of each other are, are unentangled. Things that are uh, partially correlated are partially entangled. Things that are maximally entangled, I learn as much about one thing as I possibly can by, by measuring the other thing. And They're the same thing in some ways. Well, the, the joint system uh, of, the, of the two different regions cannot be separated. Mm -hmm. that, so that's, that's the way that, that I would look at it, that you, you can't really talk about each system individually anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a departure from classical physics where it was always possible to talk about things being um, independent. And, and for the most part, uh, when things are weakly entangled with each other in, in the real world, it's a decent enough approximation to think of them as independent of one another. Um, but... There's an interesting framework where in, in this abstract space of this new physical theory, things that are highly entangled with one another correspond to regions in space and time that are close to each other. And things that are less entangled corresponds to things that are farther away in space and time. That's, that's an active program of, of research, but you know, we, we, we still don't, don't know. And it's, it's, it's really exciting and interesting to think about. So let's just say that we could have Albert Einstein sitting here in this chair what would he have to say about your test? Would he still be looking for loopholes? Is he still proving his point? But given the hundred years of work to get to this point, or is he like, yeah, I've evolved my position. It's more of this. Yeah, because he's always, you know, he's the figure. I mean, in terms of like a lay person looking at physics and everything. Well, uh, m m many of us, you know, who work on things that uh, are the legacy of his, his research would love to, you know, resurrect him from the past and have a yeah. conversation. Uh, so, but if I, if I was to speculate, I think that he would appreciate what we were doing. I, th I think that uh, he he would definitely be willing to change his mind based on uh, new evidence. But 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 ultimately, this is an interesting story where many of the the people in the physics community think that uh, Bohr was right and Einstein was wrong in this regard. Uh, that a, a a world could not be local and realist. Hmm. But I think Einstein would would appreciate the the subtlety of the of the fact that the, the case is not quite closed. So, for, for example, uh, the, you know, we, we, we know that at least one logical possibility is that you can keep locality, you can keep realism, um, and by, by 
the price is relaxing a little bit of freedom of choice. Oh, give us a sense for how much, what, what is it a little bit? You said, it, you know, vast majority is yeah. freedom. So, so I'll, I'll get a little technical here. Ooh, so nice. hex 12. So what, what we're talking about is, uh, you know, Alice and Bob uh, can each make choices on their side for their, their experimental choices. Yeah. In, in the standard experiment, they each have two possible choices. And the question is, if you look at the, the distribution of their, their possible choices, is it correlated with something that's missing from quantum mechanics? Yeah. Einstein um, and others call these hidden variables. Okay. The, so so uh, Bell's freedom of choice assumption is equivalent to the idea that the joint measurement settings are uncorrelated with the hidden variables. They have no mutual information. There's nothing you can learn about one uh, from, from measuring the other. Okay. But uh, it, it, let, let's say they had a one bit of mutual information. That would mean that um, if, if, if I you know, measured um, Alice's and, and Bob's measurement choices, I would know exactly the value of the hidden variable and vice versa. One bit is like as much information as you can get. Mm -hmm. So what we found is that you can build models where um, the mutual information between the, the joint settings and the hidden variables is uh, a small fraction of a bit, uh, one twenty-second of a bit. So, so what does that actually mean? So let's say you do this experiment 22 times. Okay. Um, and then you ask yourself, on both sides, uh, they each had two possible choices. Yeah. So you can ask, uh, if you did 22 experiments, what... Uh, how many possible sequences of measurement choices were possible? And the okay. answer is four to the twenty-second power. Hmm. Uh, if if uh, if each Bo Alice and Bob can freely make choices on both sides, but if it turned out that there was a one twenty-second of a bit of correlation, mutual information between their choices and the hidden variables, then they wouldn't actually have access to four times four to the twenty-second power, right. um, which is two trillion okay. um, choices they would have access to half of that. So yeah. one half times four to the 22nd power. So they, instead of, um, well, tw instead of, sorry, 20 trillion, they, they would, ha would have, you know, 10 trillion. Yeah. So, so, so you're still talking about a stupidly large amount of free choice. And that's a really subtle correlation. Right. L let's, say, let's say, you know, you, how could you tell the difference? So, so let me put it to you this way. As an analogy, let's say you, you went to a Mexican restaurant and, there's 10 things on the menu, and you're like, I'll have the chicken burrito. And then they tell you, ah, I'm sorry, we're out of chicken. That actually knocks off five things off the menu. So you thought you had access to 10 naively options, but you really only had access to, to five. Yeah. You still have the free, free will to choose you know, amongst the remaining options. But, Carnitas, please. But, but, you're, but the, right. yes, absolutely. Uh, but, but the amount of, of uh, options that you thought you had, the degrees of freedom you had to choose between, uh, you would have naively been overcounting. So, the, the 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 this is this is a really subtle thing. So so let's say you 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 uh, hypothesize that gravity plays a role. Okay. Th then there's this question of whether or not it's actually possible for uh, things like your measurement choices to really be uh, free and independent of things in the past. So gravity is the kind of a thing that is a long range force, and when we think about it as a force, so. It's not at all implausible to me that we we think that our choices are free and uncorrelated with things in, in, in the past in space and time, mm -hmm. but that because of gravity, it's just not possible for them to be completely free. That they 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 might only be very weakly correlated yeah. with like okay, you know, let's say somebody drops a baseball on the moon. Mm -hmm. Is that going to affect me gravitationally? Not very much, but it's not zero. It's not mm -hmm. zero. So, yeah. so the w the way I'm thinking about it is that if you, if you nobody knows how to do this calculation, but if you if you think about the gravitational influence of everything in the history of the universe and you added it up, uh, there might be a way for uh, this this uh, very subtle reduction of freedom of options to to um, come into play. So, so in in physics, we often talk about things like boundary conditions and conservation laws. That if you didn't know about them, then things can look weird and conspiratorial. Mm -hmm. so, so you might have heard of uh, conservation of energy or conservation of momentum. So in conservation of momentum, let's say you have a pair of, of particles that are created together and one goes off in one direction and the other goes off in the other direction. Because of conservation of the momentum, 
you know, when Alice measures her particle and then Bob measures his, you know, at, at the same time, they're going to have the same distance from the source. They're going to have the same speed. And th if they didn't know about conservation of momentum, they might think, what the hell is going on? Uh, how, are, how do they have exactly the same values? What are the chances of that? Uh, but but uh, so, so when, when people talk about uh, relaxing uh, freedom of choice as requiring some sort of a weird conspiracy, I, I would just ask them to, to think about, uh, well, it could very well be that there are new conservation laws in, in a new theory of physics that, that uh, don't allow uh, perfect freedom of choice to actually exist in the world. Um, and, and I think that you still have to give up something, but you're not giving up much. Giving up realism or giving up, giving up locality means that there is the possibility of faster than light influence of some sort. Right. Mm. Giving up realism means that you're not tell when you're doing physics, you're not telling a story about the world. You're talking about maybe at best what we can know about the world, but you're not talking about what's actually happening. And uh, so, so Einstein and, and you know uh, to some extent Schrodinger and, and some other physicists and and people like Lee Smolin today are interested in this program of whether or not it is still possible to build a realist theory of physics where where physics at, at its core is is actually about something. And then mm. we've we've looked at what Bell did. You know, with with uh, realism, freedom, and locality, is it possible that he's not accounted for everything properly? And 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 we're studying something, but you know, what if it was Friedman's test, and then you're like, let's also add in banana daiquiris or whatever it's going to be. Uh, well, absolutely. So so that, that there there are uh, dozens of different possible other loopholes I haven't talked about. Uh, that there are lots of other assumptions that one could question. And there are different interpretations of quantum mechanics where the entire framework of Bell experiments doesn't even make sense. Right. So uh, you might have heard of the many worlds interpretation sure. of quantum mechanics. So uh, it, it turns out that uh, in, in a Bell test, be, because Alice and Bob each have two different measurement choices, there are four different combinations of joint measurements they can make. Those are each kind of different experiments. And implicit in this whole idea is that uh, you, you can compare them all in the same timeline and same right. world. In the many worlds interpretation, um, every time a, yeah. a quantum event happens, there, there's a different branch. So it's not even coherent to talk about the, the kind of correlation that you're measuring um, in a Bell test in, in, in the many worlds interpretation. So, so that's, that's, that's an example of, let's, let's say the many worlds interpretation is true, th then, then we cannot draw the conclusions that right. we claim to, to have, have right. drawn. So... People think about this in, in the philosophy of science community, in, in the theoretical physics community. So absolutely, there are ways in, in which our, our, our results could be questioned. Mm. But that's actually a, a healthy and positive thing. And, and eventually, we want to get to a point where uh, we, we, we do different kinds of experiments that put tension on various assumptions where we really narrow down the possibilities. And it's, it's, it's a really hard thing to do. Uh, but but every time you do an experiment like our cosmic bell test, you're you're making an advance in that direction. When I think about academic research, I often refer to like the puzzle, and you know we have this puzzle with five thousand pieces, and there's five thousand puzzles around us, and all the pieces are everywhere. Is yours is your guys's work with the bell test, the cosmic bell test? Is that a puzzle piece that's fixed in already on the board as you look at quantum, or is like this is one that we believe goes in this five thousand piece puzzle? We don't know where it goes, though. I and mean, it's just like, this is a centerpiece and it's got some blue in it. Well, that's, that, that, the puzzle is a really interesting and good analogy. I, and and I, I would say that, that uh, whenever you do the, an experiment like this, what you can do is you can narrow down what we know really well and then what we, we, what we still don't know, like you know, a puzzle piece where we don't even know where to put yeah, it. Yeah, right. I, I would say that, that uh, the, uh, some of the theoretical work that we did as a motivation for performing the test and then the, the test itself. So, so you know, we know quantum mechanics is still uh, a consistent description of the of the experimental results. We, you know, we we have not you know ruled it out in any way, but we also know that that uh, we have not definitively ruled out these local realistic alternatives. And uh, again, I'll kind of go back to the point that that uh, the most interesting thing that we really know for sure is that given Bell's theorem given uh, the decades of experimental evidence for entanglement experiments, at, at least 
one or more reasonable assumptions about the world uh, that Einstein wanted to be true and that many of others have wanted to be true, we have to give up something. Yeah. And, uh, but, but it's still, the jury is still out about which one we give up. So it's up to us in the, in, in the community to kind of come up with more and more clever experiments and theoretical frameworks to, to narrow down which of, the, which of the things we have to give up. And I mean, personally, the, 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 there's a huge amount of evidence for relativity being true. So I, I want to keep the principle of locality. Mm -hmm. um, but but there, are, there, there are lots of other people who are thinking about um, getting rid of locality, hmm. which, is, which is people should do that. Maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's the way things, things go. So maybe in the framework of quantum gravity, our next theory, the world is just fundamentally non-local. But it also could be the case that maybe in that new theory, the world really is local. And the reason we see things like entanglement that look non-local, where something happening here influences something far away, is because we, we are looking at it from uh, the, the wrong perspective. Okay. So, so for example, um, in general relativity, there's this idea of wormholes. Right. The idea of uh, uh, shortcuts between distant locations in space and time. So if you travel the normal way, it takes a long time. If you jump through the wormhole, it's much quicker. If you didn't know about wormholes, and then you saw something go, go, go in here, and then like, you know. Instantaneously pop up here. Pop yeah. out there very quickly. Yeah. Um, you, you'd be scratching your head. So it could very well be, and some people have speculated, that entanglement itself is actually mediated by tiny quantum type wormholes that we don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, it, that, that's one way of, of sort of explaining why the, you, you have what looks like this something instantaneous that's happening. Or, um, but, but maybe you can't, uh, you can't use it to transmit information faster than light because it would force one of the wormholes to collapse um, if you there, there's a prohibition built into the laws of physics that that prevents that do you have um, any questions no I, I find that fascinating actually but we'll have to see it's uh you know my perspective i was an intelligence professional officer for for, for 30 years i know everything makes sense ultimately it's if it doesn't it's just something you don't know yet and that's what you guys are doing there's, there's something there we see it we don't know why but we will yeah, so, so this, is, this is going back to this question of, of uh, is the universe comprehensible by people? Yeah, And Einstein definitely, definitely believed it to be true. Yeah. So, so that, that, that it is admittedly something that, that you know, in, in the community, we, we have to take it on faith. Mm -hmm. There might be a limit. Um, I personally don't think that there is. Uh, I, I, I think, well, there, there's obviously limits in what an individual can do in their lifetime for, you know, based on finite mm -hmm. time. And, but, but I think that uh, humanity as a civilization... Uh, especially with the tools that we're going to build, the next generation, mm -hmm. uh, computing technology, yeah. artificial intelligence, uh, through them, and, and 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 by working with these these things that we could develop if we survive into the indefinite future, then I I, I think we we do have the op opportunity to possibly understand everything that can be understood, eventually. I don't think it, it's 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 an ongoing process that'll keep going forever, or at least as long as the the universe yeah. um, allows us to to still exist. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so yeah. From that perspective, I don't believe in in magic or supernatural no. things, and I, I think that the just as as you said it very well, the there are things that we know pretty well and things that we don't know at all. But eventually, it's possible in principle to to figure sure. them out. Today's magic is tomorrow's science. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and and a, a related quote which I which I love. So. Mm -hmm. Um, Arthur C. Clarke, the sci-fi author who wrote uh, 2001, mm -hmm. you know, he said, any, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Hmm. And uh, it, interestingly, so at, at UC San Diego, uh, one institute that uh, uh, is doing excellent work here is the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. So uh, Arthur C. Clarke's foundation uh, helped endow this, this center. Um, and th there are lots of fun uh, public outreach events that, that we hmm. do. And there's uh, research collaborations that are ongoing with with faculty and, and researchers uh, in the UC system, but uh, there's also a fun interplay between science and science fiction that goes on here, and and uh, I, I think that's really cool, just because the these ideas really really uh, uh, can help inform what the next generation science fiction writers are thinking about, and and science fiction writers influence scientists all the time because uh, at least in my experience, it, science fiction is the is the gateway drug. To, sure. Getting involved and interested in science, and 
you know, for, for people who are interested in science, uh, you can get a, a huge amount of, of awesome information from NOVA documentaries, from popular science books, and, and actually from science, some science fiction novels too. Uh, not, not all of them are accurate with the science, mm -hmm. but uh, the, 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 there, there are a, a number of them that are pretty cool. What's the coolest thing that you're hoping to see in the next 20 years? Just even outside of your own work and everything, given what we know of what's going on and what's coming, what's fascinating? Is it the increased use of AI? What do you think? In, in, in terms of what I think it, it, it is, is likely, um, I, I think that, uh, well, I'm interested to see uh, whether or not quantum computers uh, will be possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, the, these, are, these this is a new technology, which is... Uh, fundamentally uh, relies on entanglement and the it, it holds the promise to do amazing things that our current classical computers can't possibly do uh, in our current understanding uh, including uh, breaking the world's existing encryption codes right uh, but also learning about the fundamental uh, world even more by by being able to simulate quantum systems uh, way better than we could ever do using our computational technology today uh, th there, there is a uh, an interesting interface between artificial intelligence, machine learning, and quantum computing. That uh, the, the sky is the limit as far as uh, mm. the 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 kinds of capabilities that could be enabled yeah. by by that. Now, the engineering challenges with quantum computing might be too difficult ever to overcome, or they might uh, only uh, be overcome in a hundred years or a thousand years or something like that. But it's not. It's also not impossible that in our lifetime, yeah. uh, I mean, we already have working quantum computers that that can do a very very small amount. But uh, if you're talking about the the kinds of of quantum computers that could realize the promise uh, of of these next generation technologies, that would be really awesome to see. Um, as far as what what is uh, unlikely, but but I would be even more excited about, it would be super awesome to meet aliens. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, you know, it, I, have you I, met I, Paul? Yes, <laughs> yes, I have. Uh, anything you want to tell me? Uh, so, so I, I, you know, as an astronomer and a cosmologist, I think most of us think that it would be very weird if we were the only intelligent civilization in the entire history of the universe. No, it's mathematically it seems bizarre. But, but so. it does seem bizarre. But mm -hmm. the truth of it is, we just don't know because mm -hmm. if if life evolving is just so rare, then even the, the, the huge but finite amount of opportunities in our universe might not be enough. I mean, our galaxy, the Milky Way, has 400 billion stars. Mm -hmm. And there, there are hundreds of billions of galaxies that we, can, that we can access in the part of the universe we can observe. Mm -hmm. We only have access to a finite part of the universe. Yeah. And you know, if there's 10 to the 22nd opportunities for life, well, may, maybe even more because maybe there are 10 planets per star. Yeah. And maybe, maybe, uh, well, maybe one, let's say just one of them is, is habitable. Well, let, let's say the chance of life evolving is one in ten to the fiftieth power. Yeah, that's then, still leaves you quite a bit. Then, then, then you might not, despite the large number of, of opportunities, it might not be enough for more than mm -hmm. one. We just don't know how likely it is for for life to evolve. But th there are so many interesting things that I think that uh, uh, I would love to ask representatives from some other civilization if if. Uh, if they exist and if they actually arrived in our lifetime, that's super unlikely in my opinion, but, but that would be awesome. Given all the stuff that's out there that we don't get about our own past, do you think aliens have been here before? Or is there, is there a value greater than zero that aliens have been to this planet before? I think that the, the, the evidence that we have um, is not very strong as far as aliens having been to Earth before. Mm -hmm. it, it's... It, it, the probability is not zero right. uh, ba based on the information that we have, but all the evidence that people talk about is very weak. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a very, a very, very plausible scenario is that e even if um, alien civilizations have already evolved in our own galaxy, forget about the other galaxies sure. for the moment, the galaxy is so big, it takes 100,000 years for yeah. light to go from one side to the other. Let's say a civilization on average lives for 5,000 years before destroying itself in yeah. some way. Then you can view the galaxy like a Christmas tree. And then the question is, you know, when a light's on, that means the civilization is alive and active. Uh, the, the question is, is it ever possible for two lights to be on long enough for, and you can imagine spheres getting sent out from the lights. This is the sort of 
uh, wave front of communication, sure. uh, of mm -hmm. sending light signals to each other. Is it ever possible that uh, for one of those spheres to overlap with another one while it's still on and receiving? Hmm. And this depends on a lot of things that, that we don't know. It could be that every civilization is so sparse in space and time in the galaxy and doesn't live long enough to have a high probability of contact with another. I never thought of the time aspect. You're right. Yeah, the time. Cro I mean, Charles Krauthammer, before he passed away, that's one of the things he said is it's probably life is probably out there. But the fact is, it's probably just as prone to take themselves out as, as, as we look like we are. So, so, so it's we, unlikely they're around long enough to actually communicate. We, we, so, we, we just don't know. How, yeah. I mean, evidence here indicates that we could destroy ourselves any day, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. And, and let's not forget, like, once you get off of this and outside of an atmosphere, you're not supposed to live. So there's a zillion things that can go wrong if you send something five million light years away. You know? well, well, when you're talking about how do you colonize the solar system? Yeah. I, I think you could colonize uh, the solar system with uh, robotic emissaries that sure. are, that are uh, more, more sturdy than we are. Yeah. Or genetically engineered descendants that can handle radiation and vacuum of space and things like this. Certainly is really hard to imagine us in our current form. Yeah. Uh, it's not impossible. You, 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 you could yeah. use technology to shield yourself from the dangers, uh, but the, 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 there, there are lots of things we don't know about uh, the, the possibility of interstellar travel and yeah. colonization of other planets in our solar system, other star systems in our galaxy. And uh, but, but it's an interesting question why there isn't any very obvious strong evidence of of aliens uh, either existing. Um, somewhere or having visited us in the past. It could be that they're not out there, but then there are dozens, hundreds of explanations for that are still consistent with them existing at some yeah. place in, in, in time and space in the universe, but where it wouldn't be reasonable for us to have expected to have evidence of that yet. We've only been a technological civilization for you know, a handful of decades, yeah. let's, let's say communicating with radio waves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and who knows what technology the aliens would be using. Maybe it's radio waves, maybe it's something else that, uh, you know, yeah. maybe it's focused neutrino beams mm -hmm. that uh, we don't have the technology to do yet. Maybe we're so looking at the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Either way, it's been awesome, this conversation. We never oh, even got into really. quantum, anything, and religion, really, other than talking about Knox. So we'll have to do another episode at some point. Sure.